Uh, military intervention in Niger is not an option. That simply is not something we should do as Africans. There are better ways of dealing with our issues. Uh, our elders must come together. Our elders must have a frank uh, conversation. And let's look at what is ultimately best for the people, not only the people in Niger, but in all former French colonies and ultim ultimately in all African countries. Because this moment is calling for unity, mi meaningful unity of purpose among the African leaders to simply say, guys, this can no longer continue. It simply cannot continue. The people have spoken, and I hope our leadership would listen. I see what's happening in Niger, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Guinea very differently. If you look at the previous coups, those were orchestrated by Western powers, majority, of course, orchestrated by France. They had their own intentions, uh, in, in a few quite documented uh, very well. The leaders were trying to do what was ultimately best for their people, and those leaders were assassinated. The difference between these coups are coups being led by our people. The people have spoken. The people now truly understand the issues. The people are standing up to say what has been going on is unfair, is unacceptable. It is really just simply makes sense that something has got to give. There is a difference between the previous coups and these last four coups, especially the one in Niger. I actually, on a personal level, I feel uncomfortable even calling them coups. Uh, this is a, you look at a situation where people are basically desperate, where they know they're rich in natural resources, and yet the majority of the people are extremely poor. How long can that situation be sustained before the people finally wake up and rise up? That is what's happening. And I would like to call what's happening in, in these four countries as an, um, an ideological realignment of their economic, of their political, of their social values. At some point, if you look at, uh, at the situation with uh, the, the former French colonies, before even a president um, comes to power, there are certain no-go areas that the president must not touch, because if you do, uh, you may not live to see the end of the day. Areas like the military, areas like, the, of course, the finances and, and the reserves that must be deposited with the French Treasury, um, areas of the natural resources. So if you are a president, an African president, who is coming to power, and you are told, as long as you stay away from discussions pertaining to their presence, uh, military presence in the country, um, training of, the, of your military by France, uh, equipping of your military by France, don't talk about the natural resources, whose uh, uh, the French companies have the first right of approval. Uh, do not talk and make sure you continue to deposit your uh, bank reserves with the French Central Bank. If you avoid those areas, then you're free to run your country any which way you want. Now, what kind of a leader is that? What environment are you going to be uh, occupying and managing and running your country with all those major areas of economic development uh, no longer accessible to you. And the whole thing is so mind boggling that we have gone to over so many years, this is 2023, that the leaders in Africa have been unable to undo the agreements that were put in place when the African countries were given their independence. It is unbelievable that to this day, you can have a country like Niger to be the second poorest country in the world, and yet all their resources are going to France. Most of Niger is not electrified, while their uranium is electrifying France and Europe. You can take one after the other after the other. At every level, it's unfair. It's unacceptable, and I don't even know how the Western powers would really go to sleep every day, knowing of the carnage that they are, the havoc they are creating in Africa, and hope that this will go on forever. 
The time has come. The children of Africa are now awoken. They can see clearly now. And they're simply standing up and saying, enough is enough. So yes, we don't like coups, but the last four coups are very different in the sense that the children of Africa are very clear because they are the ones standing up and saying, we got to take back our country. We need to defend our turf. What's right is right. What is wrong is wrong. We can no longer continue to be exploited. That's what makes this different. It's not influenced by France. It's the coups are not influenced by any nation. It's simply people standing back and saying, we're taking back what belongs to us. And that's what makes this coups different. And I, I, I'm uncomfortable calling them coups. I'm calling them instead ideological realignment of our economic, political, and social values. The children have risen, and the children are speaking, and the citizens themselves are backing those who have led the uprising. And it is a warning to the Western powers that the African Revolution has begun. And those who are going to align themselves with the people are those who are going to survive uh, the revolution that's taking place in Africa. The same is true with African leaders as well. Those who will align themselves with the wishes of the people are the ones who are going to survive this revolution as well. I do believe the African revolution has begun. And those who cannot see the writing on the wall, they will not survive this revolution. There is no turning back. The children of Africa are rising. The children of Africa understand the issues. And this time, they're going to the streets, not along party lines. They're going to the streets united as citizens of Niger, as citizens of Mali, Burkina Faso, Guinea, because they understand that this particular fight has got to be dealt with from a national level, and I hope with time it will be dealt with from a continental level because the exploitation of the continent has got to stop. And this time, it is the children of Africa who are speaking, and the world better listen up. Okay. And I would want to ask the same people who are sitting at the table having those discussions about having a military intervention in Niger. Let me remind you that there are other coups that we are not talking about, that we should be talking about. By France forcing Niger to send all its natural resources to France, that's a coup. By France having its own military in, in Niger and forcing Nigerians that you can only be trained by France, that is a coup. By forcing Niger to deposit 50% of its uh, reserves with France, that is a coup. The question I have for those who are sitting on the table, during those ECOWAS meetings, during those AU uh, peace and security meetings, what have you done about those coups? Take those three coups, multiply by 14, because that's what's happening in the 14 former French colonies. Those are deadly coups that have been taking place for decades. And you ECOWAS have done nothing about those coups. I need, I need them to also answer and, and give us remedy as to how they are going to handle those coups. Make no mistake about it. Those are coups against the African citizens in those countries. And when, while they discuss what they would like to do with Niger, I would also want them to table those coups and come up with a solution as to what needs to be done. Because behind those coups that I just described from France, there are millions of children who are dying from starvation. There are millions of children who are going to bed with an empty stomach. There are millions of African youth who are unemployed. There are millions of women who are dying while giving birth to another life. I need them to put that on the table as well. If their interests are truly about the Africans, let's look at the global uh, view of the issue. Let's have a best eye view of the issue and have a frank and fair and honest discussion about what is really going on in Africa. I do know that I don't think the carnage that's going on in Africa is what ECOWAS is all about. Leadership is about the people. It's about creating a better life for the people. But if you're going to allow one who has committed egregious crimes in Africa, 
continues to have coups. Those are coups. Let's, let's call a spade a spade. You can't give France a pass. So also let us know what you intend to do about those ongoing economic and political coups that are being imposed on those 14 French uh, uh, countries, former French colonies uh, by France. So to just talk about what's happening in Niger alone, in isolation and not go to the root causes of the genesis of why what's happening is happening, uh, does simply does not make any sense. And I would hope uh, military intervention in Niger is not an option. That simply is not something we should do as Africans. There are better ways of dealing with our issues. Uh, our elders must come together. Our elders must have a frank uh, conversation. And let's look at what is ultimately best for the people, not only the people in Niger, but in all former French colonies and ultim ultimately in all African countries. Because this moment is calling for unity, me meaningful unity of purpose among the African leaders to simply say, guys, this can no longer continue. It simply cannot continue. The people have spoken, and I hope our leadership would listen. Trees. So what is your solution, my dear daughter? Let's just let, let things be. We're going to keep trying. We will keep trying. What happens is if Niger does it alone, they're not going to succeed. Because it's too small a country. It's already fighting against monstrous forces. That is why this moment is calling for everybody to support Niger. We must come together as a continent. We must speak with one voice. If we do not speak with one voice, even those who tried, are you trying to say Kwame Nkrumah didn't try? He, he tried, but he was alone. He was not supported by many African countries. Had Africa come together when African Union, at, at the African Union in, in Addis Ababa in 1963, when Kwame Nkrumah and the Casablanca group were saying Africa for the Africans and African Union now, had the Casablanca succeeded back in 1963, Africa would be sitting in a different position. So my message to the Africans is, any African country that tries to stand up against the West alone without the support of other African countries, they are not going to succeed. Make no mistake about that. We are a tiny little dot in the ocean. But when we come together as a continent, that's why Niger must be supported. Mali must be supported. They have taken a position that is right, a position that is good for the Africans, a position that simply says exploitation of the continent can no longer continue. My daughter, you tell me. Are you okay with all our natural resources creating millions of jobs for European kids when our kids cannot get jobs because our natural resources are not getting value addition? Are you okay with that? Do you call that democracy? I agree. Yes, I do agree. And also I disagree. First of all, again, going back to the genesis, keep in mind that we have walked away. We were made to walk away from our own traditional values, from our own culture, from our own indigenous ancestral leadership values. We are following their guidebook. We are following their ways of leadership. What kind of leadership tells you this is democratic? What is democratic about France forcing African countries, bullying African countries into giving up their financial resources? My daughter, answer me. What is democratic about that? What is democratic about France occupying African countries without their authority? What is democratic about France taking uh, natural resources out of Africa? 90%, 95% of Niger's lithium is powering Europe and France. What is democratic about that? So you are saying, oh, forget that democracy. Let's just, pop, let's just concentrate on this little bit of democracy. It is stupid. It goes back to the, the colonized mind. It doesn't make any sense. Before we can talk about democracy in Africa, let's practice democracy from an international point of view. Africa is not going to Europe to steal from anybody. Africa is not going to Europe to invade anybody. Let's go there first. So before you can talk about that, tell me why 90% of Niger is not electrified when their electricity, their lithium is powering Europe. Answer that. Now we can talk about democracy. Let's not be stupid. Reality is, what is happening in Niger is those students in that dining room. It's now immunity, immuni uh, a mutiny. They want to keep their lunch. They're saying this time is going to be different. We just want to keep our lunch. And through that document, uh, African countries, the former French colonies, uh, upwards, it used to be 85% of, of their bank reserves 
had to be deposited with the French Treasury is now down to around 50 to 60 percent. To this day, poor countries are sending their bank reserves to France. To this day, poor countries, the first right of refusal of all, of all contracts, public, private, large, small French companies, the first right of refusal. To this day, all minerals discovered yet to be discovered, France has the first right of ref refusal. To this day, those former French colonies, all their uh, mi military must be trained by France. All their military equipment must be purchased from France. And France has a presence in their countries and can invade those countries without notice should they feel the French interests are being violated. So at every level, the document is horrible and it remains in place today. I was horrified when I began to see the extent to which people simply did not know. So I made that my mission number one. Because as a medical doctor, if you're dealing with, uh, with, a, with let's say, an accident situation, you first uh, assess uh, the heart. Does the patient have a heartbeat? Is the patient breathing? You don't worry about the broken bone. You don't worry about other peripheral damages. You start with the core. If the patient is breathing, if the patient has a heartbeat, you must revive them, get a heartbeat, get the lungs, get them breathing, and then you can deal with the other peripheral issues. So I felt the heartbeat of what was ailing Africa started with France. If we can deal with what France is doing in Africa, dealing with the rest of the colonizers will be easy, for their roots are not as entrenched into Africa as the French roots to this day. I'm going to start with, of course, uh, the, uh, the mind, which of, is where, at the end of the day, that is where the problem really is. The legacy of colonization remains to be a serious issue for the African. It is the legacy of colonization that makes it difficult for us as a people to push back. Let me give a very simplistic example, and I use simplistic examples because I want people to really understand what's going on. Using the example of Niger, there is a mutiny in the school cafeteria. The students are sick and tired of a bully who's been taking their lunch for centuries. Finally, finally, they've garnered enough courage. They now have enough knowledge to understand, and they're ready to stand up and push back against the bully. The question then becomes, why has it taken the student so long to, to stand up and push the bully back? It's both because the students have been made to believe that you are inferior. The students have been threatened. The students believe that they're not as good as the bully. The headmaster, some have been smart enough and have tried to push back. Guess what? They were assassinated. But finally, the students now have enough knowledge. Question is, why has it taken this long for the students to have enough courage? But be it as it may, the legacy of slavery, the legacy of colonization left the African in a feeling inferior, feeling they're incapable, admiring everything else that somebody else is doing, that everything African is undesirable, that we're always looking to what those who don't look like us are doing, and we want to emulate what they are doing. Mm -hmm. That, to me, the biggest risk to Africa's development is the mind. The biggest problem right now is the mind. I still believe it is the mind. Secondly, the average African leader is fighting with their hands tied behind their back, and in some cases also blindfolded. Um, I really don't want us to get lost in the mud about peripheral issues. Remember what I said, you get into an accident situation, first you are said the heartbeat, does the patient have a pulse? Is the patient breathing? We worry about the blown up eye, we worry about the broken bone later. And for Africa, I came to the conclusion that France was the biggest risk to peace and security and overall African development, particularly in West Africa, because of one particular agreement that they would make the African heads of state sign when they were receiving their independence. It was a horrible, continues to be a horrible document that sadly, it has been allowed to continue to this very day, to the serious detriment of the Africans. So I set out to educate the Africans about France. Others would say, why didn't you talk about the British and all other colonizers? Yes, we would speak about them as well. But the route, the one that is leading the park, the one that is taking the crown of the abuse and exploitation, it is France. 
And I felt very strongly that if France can come to the table and, uh, and uh, also uh, renegotiate those contracts, if France can leave Africa, that would be the beginning of true liberation. And I'm talking economic liberation of the African continent. So France is leading the pack because of its deep roots within Africa, because of the uh, agreements that they, the heads of states were made to sign during independence of Africa. We must go to the root causes. If a president of a country, my daughter, let me take you, you become the president of Nigeria today with all good intentions. You are told, do not talk about your military because we got that under our control as France. Do not talk about your financial resources. We control your central bank. We manage your, your, your financial uh, policies. Do not talk about your finances. We have that under our control. Do not talk about your natural resources. Those belong to us. All your contracts, we shall choose and decide who builds your country. Now, if you stay away from all that, you are not free to run your country. What do you have? You've given up your natural resources. You've given up control of your financial resources. You've given up control of your military. What kind of a leader are you? I don't care what intentions you have. I don't care how Pan-African you are. I don't care how smart you are. Your hands are tied behind your back and you're blindfolded and you are supposed to engage in a fight and win. How? So I'm saying, before we even talk about how good a leader you are, I can tell you, I was joking with a friend. I said, I'm pretty sure right now, President Bazoun is probably happy. Because what kind of country was he leading? He had no power. He had nothing to control. That's a joke of a leadership. So once we understand that, we then go back and say, okay, fine. With whatever you were given, what have you done with it? Now I'm ready to start putting blame on the leader to say, okay, you, were, you had a small budget for, uh, for, for healthcare. What did you do? Did you at least build one hospital during that year? Now, if it's a foreign minister, uh, a minister of uh, health, who is now failing to do something with that budget for one year, that's why we start putting the blame on local levels to say, yes, as a minister of health, you were given a budget, show us at least one health hospital you built this year. Show us what you have done. So yes, we do have our own leadership issues, leadership within very limited uh, spaces. And even in those countries that are not former French colonies, we still have major presence and control by the multinationals who existed during colonization. They just went low, but they're still by and large running African countries. They're the ones who are the major employers and they can manipulate the, uh, the politics because of their presence within the country. They can gang up against a country and decide suddenly 10 of them, 15 of them can leave the country, taking away with them hundreds and thousands of jobs. So they still have some soft ways, underhanded ways of dealing and upsetting African economies. It still goes back to the former colonizers. So as we talk about our issues in Africa, let's not look at them in isolation. Let's understand in a holistic way all the issues that are coming to play when we end up with millions of youth unemployed. Why? Understand the entire process. Millions of children going to bed on an empty stomach. Millions of children dying. Women dying while giving birth to another life. Let's understand the entire genesis of what is going on. Because the tendency is for us to be pigeonholed and follow, and follow into this rabbit hole of a tiny little issue without understanding the genesis of that issue. And that is the holistic approach that I want the new African to have, to fully have a depth of understanding of what is going on. So we know when we are fighting, is it a fight that is local, that goes to my to my house? Is this my village fight? Is it my providential, uh, pr uh, province, uh, provincial uh, fight? Is it a country fight? Is it a sub African sub-regional fight? Or is it a continental fight? At every level, there are certain tools in our toolbox that we need to pull out. But to think you can take a village issue and apply it to a continental issue, that is stupid, that is ignorant, and we want our people to be politically mature and understand what fight this is, where we call for unity at the village level, unity at the national level, unity at the party level, unity at the continental level. So your question is a very difficult one to answer. My key point is to say, at what level is this fight? Mm -hmm. If it is a village fight, I can tell you how to apportion the blame. If it is a provincial level, if it is a national level, it is a continental level. It depends at what level this fight is all about.
Yes, actually, you're quite right. I am African first and foremost. I'm an African who was born in a place called Zimbabwe and uh, became a Ghanaian citizen uh, through marriage. And so, yes, every, the answer is yes to all your suggestions. But first and foremost, I am an African. As a medical doctor, I went to Washington, of course, reluctantly. Uh, but of course, once a doctor, always a doctor. I started making diagnosis while I was, uh, I was in Washington. And my diagnosis, uh, first and foremost, became the ignorance that we had of our understanding of Africa, not only as, as Africans, not as black people around the world, but even members of Congress themselves, the US government, they really don't understand Africa. So I set out to address the issue of the ignorance about what, go, what was going on in Africa. Educating the African diaspora primarily and secondarily, those in the US government and anybody else that wished to listen to the message. Because I felt that that was the root cause of what was going on in Africa, the lack of understanding and appreciation of what was really going on in Africa, and more importantly, identifying the root causes. I'm not going to run for any office. The only office I would consider running is the chairman of the African Union Commission. That's it. Because I do feel that there is a need for a voice there. Right now, there is no voice. African Union is like a dead entity. Um, and something needs to happen there. African Union is one entity that could speak on behalf of the continent, that could speak and call out those who are abusing, abusing Africa. It is the one place that we could actually let the world know that the exploitation and abuse of the Africa, Africa, African continent has got to come to an end. That voice is not there. That is the only place that I think I can make a difference. Besides that, no. I'm already in Africa, by the way. I spend half of my time in Africa now. I travel uh, quite a bit, and uh, I intend to continue to do so. Okay. Let me tell you the honest goodness, tr truth when it comes to the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. It's a wonderful idea. It's the one thing that the African leaders have been able to accomplish uh, that was discussed during the creation of the OAU. Of course, we talk about one uh, military, we talk about one currency, what customs union and all that. Of all the required pillars of Africa's development, the trade is one issue that the, uh, the heads of states have been able to deliver. However, here is my biggest fear. As long as there's no free movement of people, it's going to be very difficult to implement the African continent of free trade area. As long as we still have the exodus of African uh, capacity, uh, we are going to have issues with implementation of the African continental free trade area. My biggest fear right now is that because of the African continental free trade area, we have now put a system in place where if we do not wake up to the reality, we are going to be handing Africa back to the colonizers, this time on a silver platter. Who has the funds to build the transcontinental highway? It's not us black people. Who has the funds and the capacity to bring about the development, to build the ports, to build uh, the infrastructure that is required? It is not us. So who are the companies that are getting the contracts to implement the African continental free trade area? They're Chinese companies. They're Middle Eastern companies. They're European companies. They're Indian companies. It's everybody else except us. I have not seen a push to promote Africans coming together as a continent. I've not seen a push to line, line up the opportunities and say 60% of these must be occupied, must be run. These contracts must be given to Africans, must be given to black people. I've not seen that document that's demanding that X amount must stay with the people. That is where I see the problem going to be. If we do not manage the implementation of the African continental free trade area, we are going to be handing Africa back to the colonizers, this time on a silver platter. That is my, my, my fear, and I hope it does not come to fruition. We need to make sure that we speak very strongly to it. We need a document that says, at a minimum, 60% of all the contracts must go to the Africans. And then we set out a plan to make sure that the Africans are educated and informed about the process of getting these contracts. We must also be very clear about how to mobilize the funding so Africa can be built by the Africans for the Africans. We do not mind 
foreign direct investment. We do not mind our friends coming to help us, but Chinese do not look to outsiders to build China. Europeans do not look to outsiders to build Europe. No one else looks outside their region to build their regions. Why do we Africans, why must we always look outside? But also the Secretary General for the African Continental Free Trade Area must go the extra mile to educate and inform the Africans and also open doors for those opportunities for Africans to build the Africa that they want through the African Continental Free Trade Area. If that is not done, colonization 202 is around the corner. Development, but again, it has to be managed. My understanding of that development bank is that the funds will be given to the country and then their job is to follow behind and, and monitor the process and the manner in which the funds are being used. I think it's a good uh, step in the right direction. I was actually able to meet with the, um, uh, one of the directors uh, for, the, uh, for that bank, a uh, very jacked up lady who understands Africa well. Um, so I think if we do our part as Africans, that's actually a very good thing. But we must also do our part. The problem with us Africans is always implementation on the ground. So it's about education. It's about really coming up with a special focus and, and talking to the people. Let them get a buy-in from the people. Because once people have a buy-in, it's easier for them to move forward. But if the monies are just flooded into the country without the buy-in from the, from the people, without really letting them know, not only from their own little community point of view, but they must look at it and say, what I'm doing is not only for my community, but it's for my country, it's, my, it's for my Sadak region, and it's for my continent. Let people feel proud of what is going on. Let them understand that what I'm doing right now is actually a fight against the Chinese. It's a fight against the Europeans. So when we go to the world stage, we can stand up together as Africans and say, look what we have done. Just to the extent that the Chinese are proud of having built the China that they built. We too must have that spirit. So that spirit must be, must be, must be cultivated from a village level, from the country level, from sub-regional level, and ultimately to the continental level. So as the funds are being pushed into Africa, are we educating our people? Are we making our people feel proud of what they're doing and the effects of what they're doing, how it percolates to a better Africa, which is what we want. Mm. So yes, the bank is a good thing. It's a good starting point, and we can actually use it to benefit our participation and by our, I mean us Africans, our participation in the, uh, in the implementation of the African continent of free trade area. Great outcome, but it must be nurtured.